going to uh, get into the story of Melchizedek. We've been referred to him before by the writer. He's referenced of him. Uh, now we're going to dive right in. So let's turn in our Bibles to Hebrews chapter 7. And we're going to read verse 1 to verse 4. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham, returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated king of righteousness, and then king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made, like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. Okay, Melchizedek. Now we first meet him in the book of uh, Genesis. You're probably aware of the story, but the four Canaanite kings have been headed uh, or led by uh, King uh, Chedorlaomer. Uh, they attack, these five kings attack the Transjordan. They defeat the city-states of Sodom. Uh, they take off with them uh, uh, from these cities, all these neighbors. They take off a large number of hostages and spoils. Now, the reason why, and I'm sure skirmishes and wars happen all the time, but the reason why this particular battle is brought into the Word of God is whether wittingly or unwittingly, they took with them these four, these five kings, they took with them Abraham's nephew as a hostage. Lot was living at the time in Sodom and he got caught up in the, in the battle and they, they took him off as a captive. Now, uh, undaunted Abraham responds and we pick up the story in verse 14 of chapter 14 in the book of Genesis. Now when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, uh, he armed his 318 trained servants who were born in his own house and went in pursuit as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night. He and his servants attacked them and pursued them as far as Kobar, which is north of Damascus. So he brought back all the goods and brought back his brother Lot and his goods, as well as the women and the people. <laughs> uh, uh, don't mess with Abraham, I think is the message. Uh, Abraham, he, he takes on five victorious kings with all of their uh, uh, might and power. Uh, I, I tell you, don't mess with Abraham. His name would have, would, would have traveled like lightning through the neighborhood. <laughs> In the Middle East, this guy's one tough, one tough guy. Uh, he was at the zenith at that time of his power and his influence. He has just defeated a huge coalition of kings and armies with, with, uh, with, with force, and he delivered all from their grasp. I mean, you can make a movie about it. And uh, uh, again, uh, maybe I watched too many movies uh, when I was a kid, but I can see him uh, walking, <laughs> walking, walking along, man. And people are like, whoa, is Abraham kind of ducking their head or, or bowing, bowing their, uh, their caps to him because uh, he was a pretty, he's a powerful man and he's got an incredible group of men with him. Now you say, Pastor Brown, I don't know what's happened to you today. You're a bit, uh, you're a bit uh, dramatic. Well, I guess what we're trying to do is build a picture. I'm trying to build for you a picture that Abraham in his own right was a very powerful man. And yet the moment he meets Melchizedek, this, this figure, this shadowy figure of of. Uh, uh, status and grandeur, Abraham, this powerful man, is humbled and immediately wants Melchizedek's blessing, gives him a tithe of all, all of his spoils, which is a symbol of submission. I mean, it's got to grab your attention. The Bible says in verse 17, and the king of Sodom, 
uh, this is a, again Genesis 14, went out to meet him at the valley of Shaveh, that is the king's valley, after his return from the defeat of Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him. Then, so now we have the introduction of Melchizedek. Uh, then Melchizedek, the king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was the priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hands. And he gave him a tithe of all. Melchizedek is mentioned in Genesis as a historical figure, and it's the only time he's mentioned. Nothing. Now, later on, about a thousand years, David is going to give a prophetic word about him, but as a historical figure, that's it. No more stories, no more accounts, no more explanations, nothing. Yet Abraham, the, the, this, uh, this very powerful man, favored by God, uh, bows to him. A priest, so powerful, so overwhelming, so indisputable that Abraham immediately, without question, without doubt, without hesitation, acknowledges him. And the writer of our text says, you should consider how great that man was, Melchizedek, because uh, to whom even the patriarch Abraham gave him a tenth. What a story. Hundreds of years later, King David, moved by the Holy Ghost, is going to prophesy and give a prophetic word in Psalms 110 verse 4, and he's going to prophesy, the Lord has sworn and will not relent. You are a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. It's a prophecy that God's intention was to bring into history one who would be like a priest, who would be a priest like Melchizedek or of the order of Melchizedek, should I be a little bit more uh, 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 correct. The writer's opening statement is he is deliberately uh, uh, bringing uh, Melchizedek, connecting him to the type of the ultimate, that Melchizedek, I'm sorry, was a type of the ultimate priesthood of Jesus Christ. For this Melchizedek, the king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being translated uh, uh, king of righteousness and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace, without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Now consider how great a man this was. But listen, made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. This was a type. This Genesis, uh, uh, Melchizedek priesthood, was a type of the priesthood to come because uh, what the writer is doing is he's saying this. He's saying, listen, Melchizedek, a type of priesthood, Jesus himself belonged to an order of priesthood that was unique, that predated Aaron's order of priesthood by hundreds of years. In fact, it was the first ever priesthood. Secondly, you have to understand something. Aaron's priesthood came from the tribe of Levi. We know that. Kings came from the tribe of Judah. There was no Hebrew that could unite those two offices, king and priest. The one who tried was a, a chap called King Uzziah in 2 Chronicles chapter 26, verse 16 to 19. It's going to come up on your, on your screen and you can read that. You know the story. Uh, king Uzziah uh, went in. Uh, his heart's lifted up. He enters into the very temple of the Lord. He wants to offer up uh, his own uh, burn incense on the altar. And the priests are shocked. Uh, king Uzziah, it's not for you to burn incense. 
He does so. God gets angry, strikes him, uh, and he dies uh, as a leper. Melchizedek was both the king, king of Salem, a king and a priest. So this priesthood, not only did it predate Aaron's priesthood, but it incorporated both offices. There's only one who could do that. You're right. Jesus. King of kings and Lord of lords and the great high priest. Zechariah chapter 6 verse 13. Yes, he shall build the temple of the Lord. He shall bear the glory and shall sit and rule on the throne. So shall he be a priest on his throne and the council of peace shall be between them both. The king of righteousness, our text tells us of Melchizedek, king of righteousness, king of Salem, or king of peace. We're talking about Jesus uh, uh, is the righteous one and the prince of peace. At the cross, Psalms tells us, mercy and truth have met together, righteousness and peace have kissed. Melchizedek was a type a type of the ultimate priest that Christ was. He foreshadowed his kingdom, his priesthood, his righteousness, and his peace. And the Holy Spirit has deliberately introduced Melchizedek as he does with no ancestors. We have no lineage to follow. He's introduced startlingly, is that the word startlingly? Uh, uh, with, a, with, a, with, a, with a shock. He's introduced suddenly into the narrative of the Word of God and then just as quickly as we see him, whoom, with the same significance, he disappears, not to be mentioned again until a, prophesy, a prophecy hundreds of years later. Well, the reason why that was done was to, so that the writer of Hebrews could bring this lesson. He could speak of an eternal priesthood. He has no revealed history, no record of birth and death, and so symbolically he had neither beginning nor end. Without mother, sorry, without father, without mother, without genealogy, uh, having neither beginning of days nor end of, end of days, he was made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. The Levitical priest, I think that his, uh, uh, his uh, years of service was 30 years. Melchizedek, the picture is given, and therefore brought into reality by Jesus, is that of an eternal priestly reign. The power, uh, uh, this was, some want to get us into the debate, well, who was Melchizedek? He's a type. Some say he was Shem. Some say he was an angel. Some say Enoch. Some say it was, it was the appearance of Christ himself. A, 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 this is how you said a, a, a Christophany, a Christophany, a Christophany even, <laughs> Christ often he, that, that uh, Jesus uh, uh, appearing uh, uh, Christ himself in the Old Testament. The issue is, however, the issue is to point us to the priesthood and to eternal priesthood. And the reason is, is that uh, uh, we're going to understand verse 1 to verse 24 of chapter 7 uh, is, is the writer is going to be talking about the eternal superior priesthood of Jesus as our hope of eternal uh, intervention and salvation. God's wrath never changes. Uh, there's one hope for sinners, uh, and that is uh, that uh, through Jesus Christ, we have to have a faithful high priest who will intercede for us forever, and the answer is Jesus Christ. I bring this to a close. Leon Morris said these words, and it is the Son of God who is the standard, not the ancient priest king. The writer sell, says that Melchizedek was made like, and there's the Greek word, the Son of God. Listen, the very important part of this. 
He was made like the Son of God. Not that the Son of God was made like him. Because actually it's not even Melchizedek that sets the pattern and Jesus follows it. Rather, the record is about Melchizedek. Melchizedek so arranged that it brings out certain truths that apply far more fully to Jesus Christ than they ever do to Melchizedek. It is as if, F.B. Meyer says, the father could not await the day of his son's priestly entrance within the veil, but must needs anticipate the marvels of his ministry by embodying its leading features in a miniature or priesthood of Melchizedek. In Jesus Christ, Melchizedek points us to made like the Son of God, his priesthood, his eternal priesthood, a priesthood way before Aaron, is to point us and to lead us to the very eternal priesthood of Jesus Christ. Amen. What a great study. What an interesting person Melchizedek is, that even Abraham, this mighty, mighty warrior, this mighty man, immediately revered, paid tithes to. And uh, amen, what a great study. So tomorrow, uh, Wednesday, we're going to come back together, one o'clock, and then we're going to consider this issue of tithes and move on uh, uh, through, the, through the scripture, looking at Melchizedek, the issue of tithing, perfection, and so forth and so on. Join us tomorrow. God bless. One o'clock. I'll see you then. Amen.